Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to episode 71 of Direwolf20's Let's Play series. I'm here hanging out in my newly constructed cobble works. As you can see, I've kind of cleaned up the walls, covered up things, made it look a little bit nicer in here. It's not super gorgeous, but it looks good, at least in my opinion. Uh, we are going to work on a couple things today. Um, First off, I want to touch on uh, some of the things that I've changed between last episode and this one. The most important change uh, that I'm going to highlight to you guys, and let me just steal all this cobble out of here so that it doesn't backlog or anything. And remember, any cobble that we put in the system that's over 4096 automatically gets trashed. Cool. So uh, let's take a look. We are going to turn this guy on. Note that I've put him in round robin mode instead of first destination uh, uh, mode. So by doing that, check this out. When the cobblestone starts flowing, remember before it was bouncing around back and forth and back and forth and continuously bouncing around? Well, this time, every time it hits an inventory that's full, it's going to follow the round robin mechanics and try and take turns hitting different inventories. What this means is it'll eventually always find its way to the inventory that's going to have uh, the least amount of cobblestone currently in it, aka it's going to eventually hit that cyclic assembler. So if we watch here, you'll see cobblestone eventually making its way to the cyclic assembler, and it doesn't keep bouncing between the resonant uh, pulverizers and uh, the furnace that's cooking up smooth stone. Notice how there's no longer smooth stone bouncing around in the system here. Before, this would have kept bouncing over and over again because it would leave here and try and find the nearest, which would be here, and then it would try and find the nearest to this one, which would be here, and then this one would try and find the nearest, which would be here. So it kept bouncing around because, uh, you know, this one uh, was further away from the rest. So now that we're in round robin mode, it's going to take turns and it's going to just go here, then here, then here, then here. And in the end, we're going to wind up with all of our cobble eventually making it to the cyclic assembler as long as these guys remain full, which they will, because um, it's gonna be in that mode that's gonna just round robin. So it'll take turns sending stuff to these inventories. So that cuts down on the bouncing around of cobblestone in the pipes. Remember, whenever you're building a system that does have pipes and routing, you wanna be a little bit knowledgeable about how many items are currently in there. You don't wanna have an overabundance of items bouncing around in the pipes. Um, just, you know, for best practices, let's say. Uh, so today's episode, we're going to expand upon this. We're going to quickly build something that will deal with all this cobblestone, and then we should be able to turn this on and just let it run full blast. And uh, what we should wind up with is a lot of stuff that does a lot of things. Let's take a look. Uh, so first, I'm going to want some schematics, blank ones. One, two, three, four, five, six. We need more of this stuff, so let's get a stack or two. And that should turn on our sugarcane farm. Oh, look what I hear. A sugarcane farm turning on. Boom. What's up? Hey, sugarcane. How you doing? Missed you guys. Don't worry. It'll only be on for a bit while it refills the sugarcane that's in the system. Nice. 668. What did I have this threshold set at? 800. Cool. So he should uh, start clearing here. I'm wondering if that's a visual bug. No, he's actually not turned on. Oh, you know what? I might be having issues with... Yeah, I bet I have channel issues. That's a high possibility. All right, we're going to have to deal with that later. For now, um, let's take a look at this. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven schematics here ready to go. Let's place down our cyclic assemblers. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we probably want to go ahead and uh, reset all of these. So remember, shift click in the middle there resets them all. They're all getting powered, which is nice to see. And then uh, we want to have schematics in every one. So we'll set that up real quick. There we go. Yeah, I didn't think so. Cool. So everybody's got a schematic, we're ready to roll. Let's get our first set of cobblestone here. You'll see that'll start compressing what's already in there. We're gonna set this guy to output to the left, and we're gonna set this guy to import from the right. So there we go. Uh, the schematic configuration will be as follows. Boom, check, done. And then this guy is gonna be configured to output to the right and import from that side, cool. So we're gonna clearly need um, some more cobblestone before we can go much further than this but we've already got to the point where we're crafting triple compressed cobble. Nice. So let's turn this guy on. At this point, it's ready to go. So remember, I was kind of holding off on turning this on until we had um, these compressors ready to go so that we can quickly get our cobblestone that we want. We always want a destination for this cobblestone to work its way towards. Nice. 
So you can see all excess cobblestone is making its way in here. We're getting double compressed. We're getting triple compressed. Um, and again, we're going to configure this guy to output and then input. And he's going to wind up outputting to the top. And this guy will input from the bottom and output to the right. Input, output, input, output, input. And then we'll figure out what we're going to do with this. I'll either have like a um, ME interface there or a barrel or something for that thing to catch up on. So you can see these things all running and doing what they're supposed to be doing. Awesome. Uh, you've got six triple compressed cobblestone so far, so you can see we're quickly getting into the triple range. Uh, but once you start getting beyond triple and you get into quadruple and quintuple compressed, that's when things are going to take a while. Um, and that's fine. Like, that's totally fine. We are okay with things taking a while. Um, nice. So everything's kind of flowing pretty smoothly in here. I like it. We're up to eight. So one more and we can get, well, actually, I think I can probably configure you even with just the eight. And then, once we get one more of these guys all set, we're up to eight double compressed. So, there we go, nine. Oh, I forgot to hit the check. My bad. Done. And now we've got quadruple compressed, which we'll go ahead and configure because we've got one of those. Hey, I said check mark. Maybe we actually do need to uh, have it all in there. Oh no, we're good, we're good. Uh, one quintuple compressed cobblestone, cool. So it's already programmed, awesome. All right, so we are in good shape. All right, looking good. I'll come back in a minute here after this run for a bit and we'll see where things are. And then we might just wanna tidy up this room a little bit, but other than that, the cobble works is pretty much finished. Not too shabby. So one thing I just went and crafted real fast was some more uh, world interaction upgrades. So let's boost that up. Nice. 64 is pretty much your best bet. Um, that should drastically increase the amount of cobblestone that we're able to throw out there. And that should speed this up a little bit more. Not bad. So, I mean, if we were really that interested in, you know, the compressed cobblestone stuff, sure, we could do this a little bit faster. There's definitely faster ways to do this. Um, you know, we could have uh, more transfer nodes and we could really ramp this up, but I'm not super concerned about it. Uh, the main thing is, is that we're really focused on making glass, smooth stone, and sand. The compressed cobblestone is kind of an afterthought. It's almost like the garbage can, right? It's meant to be there to catch any excess cobble being thrown out. Uh, you know, if we were really looking to get a lot of octuple compressed cobble for some reason, we could easily improve this and make it faster. But for now, it's going to be sufficient. One other other thing though I would like to do is get the speed upgrades in here. So I'm going to go craft, uh, these are all resonant versions of the machine, so I'm going to go get the uh, augmentations ready and then we'll see how well this thing runs once we've really sped it up. And there we go. So let's insert these augments in all three machines. One, two, three. Definitely faster. One, two, three. Nice. So now we're just ramping up the speed at which we uh, are producing things. Oh, I only made three of each. Derp. Dire derp. Here we go. One, two, three. Nice. So now we are definitely uh, doing a good job compressing this. Now, what should happen, by the way, is once we have a backlog of a certain type of item, so let's say we fill up on sand, okay, what this should cause is all um, sand here that gets pulverized to kind of be blocked off. So we probably want to have sand wind up being allowed to be trashed as well. So remember we have a filter on the trash can here that says gravel. Um, but I'm thinking we might want to have sand be an option. Well, no, that should be okay. Cause it'll eventually, the sand should all, instead of routing here, will pretty much all route to here. And that should be okay. Um, yeah, that should be all right, I think. It'll slow down the acceptance of sand here. So we'll see what happens once our sand barrel fills up. But I think we'll be cool. Yeah, we'll come back here in a little bit once we've had some time to, you know, process everything and see how it goes. So we're on quadruple compressed. You're set, right? We haven't got any quintuples yet, but that's okay. All right, we'll be back in a few. All right, guys, one more quick uh, maintenance task, I guess you could call it, is um, by turning on the sugarcane farm, we actually lost access to our cobblestone. So I think that's all on the same channel as we can see over here. Uh, this thing kicked on, which drained the last couple channels that we had available on this thing. So... Uh, my thoughts are, let's straighten that out. See, so we, uh, I mean, we really shouldn't have actually. I think we have enough channels available. Let's see, if I reconnect this. Uh, 
that thing should kick up to a certain number of channels there. See, cobblestone disappeared. Um, that's because... Uh, I actually don't know why that's because. I feel like we have enough channels here, but I must be tapping into something that I don't realize. So let's remove that channel. We'll take this off here. That should get us our cobblestone back. Pause for effect. And glass and sand, for that matter. And remember, we didn't have enough channels connected down there, so we ran out, right? So there's cobblestone, it's back, glass is there, sand is there, cool. So let's, uh, this one's full, well, not enough for the four that we need over there, or five even. So let's create a new connection off this dense cable. We're going to do this, and we're going to need some cable anchors to block this off. We could do this with colored cables too if we wanted, but I'll go with the cable anchor method right now. And then we'll just hit U, and we'll remove this, and connect U. So that should tap in. Our sugar cane should be good now, and we should be grooving. Oh, I just heard sugar cane get broken, so that's cool. Awesome. Wireless access still online. Sugar cane's looking good. Yes, we're using five channels there, four for the sugar cane and one for the level emitter. Nice. And this thing still has plenty of channels. At some point, I am really going to need to redo my AE system. But that sounds like a fun task to me. Um, we'll get to that, though. Right now, let's move into something different. So guys, believe it or not, it really didn't take long to fill up these barrels with 64 stacks of glass, sand, and smooth stone. You can see we've actually almost hit it. Uh, we only have about half a stack of glass to go, and then it's going to be backlogged, and the sand is already backstuffed. So we're pretty good on that. You'll notice all the sand is currently going into the redstone furnace and then bouncing back into the pulverizer, which itself is, you know, being kept pretty full. Um, if we keep an eye on this just about now, we should complete the backstuffing. So what's going to happen here is uh, all this sand will be cooked into glass. The glass is going to remain in the redstone furnace uh, and all the remaining sand is going to eventually be backstuffed back into the pulverizer, which we should see happen any moment here as well. Dun 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 dun. So there we go. Um, 64 glass, 64 sand, that gets stuffed. The sand is no longer being processed. Cobblestone will continue to go in here as this sand backstuff fills, uh, but eventually cobblestone will no longer be accepted into here. Um, and the same for here. So you can see this pulverizer, all its sand is getting filled as well. And then finally, uh, the redstone furnace up here is continuing to smelt smooth stone for us, but that looks like it's about ready to finish also. Uh, and then once that's done, all cobblestone will eventually be routed to the cyclic assemblers, where it's going to continue to be processed. As you can see, we're already having a lot of action happen here. I might look at, I don't even know if you can augment the speed of the cyclic assembler, to be honest with you, but we'll see. Uh, I might just need to tone down how fast the cobblestone is routing into here, because wow, that is quick. Yeah, we might uh, have some backstuffing issues, but we'll find out what happens. No worries. Uh, so you can see, yes, the sand here is full. The sand here is about to be full and our smooth stone is also full. So once this thing backstuffs, we will have a full set of stone, sand, and glass, and then everything will eventually be routing its way into the cyclic assemblers. Awesome. There we go. This guy's almost done. I just kind of wanted to record on camera uh, the completion of the system, how everything works once all things are backstuffed. So you can see everything eventually is going to get bounced out um, and routed directly to the only inventory that cobblestone can go to, which is this guy. Cool. Oh yeah, he's having no problem keeping up with the steady stream of cobble. So that's good. We still haven't quite gotten there, but we've got four quintuples compressed. That's not bad. So we're not quite there on the septuple, but that's okay. Now, if I were to take something out, like a stack of glass, boom, all of a sudden, everything lights back up. We start processing more glass. We start processing more sand. And the following uh, thing that we saw just a minute ago will occur again. It'll eventually balance out. Everything will be backstuffed. And we'll, again, have just a nice setup where you know, automatically we've got this thing all routing again and all the cobble going directly into making octuple compressed cobble. And the sand, the glass here is already refilled, so that's cool. Nice. All right, guys, we will be back. All right, guys, the next task is something that I've been putting off for 70 episodes. I'm finally making a magnum torch. Uh, so I've got my Enderflux crystals and my QED here going. It's really not terribly complicated, but I wanted you to know I was setting it up. Uh, I've kind of 
gotten tired of monsters showing up outside my house every time it gets nighttime, and I wanted to deal with that. So the Magnum Torch, for those of you who don't know, will prevent monsters from spawning in, in a pretty large area. Um, the uh, thing that we don't have to worry about it blocking, though, is uh, this stuff over here. So this will continue to work just fine, as will the area above my blood magic area. So we don't have too much to worry about there. Um, but, you know, this will prevent random monsters from spawning outside, which will be kind of nice, because it means my area outside my base should be relatively well taken care of. And there we go. Completed Magnum Torch. I think I'll just place that relatively... I mean, I like putting it outside. It really doesn't matter where it goes. But maybe like right on the center of my base type of area. Maybe right there. Cool. Magnum Torch engaged. Now when it's nighttime, no longer worrying about monsters spawning. And we'll even demonstrate this by making it nighttime. Haha. -ha. We should see no monsters spawning anywhere nearby. See on the minimap? Nothing. Alright guys, we are back. And I think I'd like to start working on a mod that we haven't played with in a while. It's time to look a little bit more at Blood Magic. That's right, it's been a while since we've really taken a look at this mod. I still kind of wanted to finish up my Blood Magic Tower. Uh, there's a few things I'm going to want to implement. Um, I'm trying to map out exactly where I want everything to be and figure it out. I might want to build this tower up and have a second story that's just above this platform here. So maybe like just to give myself a little bit of room, like three stories up and then like, you know, or three blocks up and then have a second story, right, that's kind of up here that I could, you know, jump back and forth between with uh, elevators or something, right? elevator up to the top um, and the second story will have some automation related stuff that would be a lot of fun to work on and build so my plan is at first uh, and for this episode what I want to do is get some automation centered around some of the things that are kind of a nuisance to craft with blood magic one of them in particular being these guys uh, the reinforced imbued and blank slates so so the many different types of slates that are available and then at some point we are going to want to get um, probably tier five and six altar. We're going to want to get automation around some of the really cool and advanced stuff. And I would also like to, before the end of this series, get to some of the advanced spell creation system things that are available in blood magic. So my goal is to automate as much of blood magic as possible because there's a lot of manual labor and effort involved in some of the blood magic mechanics. With that said, let's get started with what I'm going to call the very first section of this, automating the different slates. So I've been considering how I want to do this, and my plan, I think, is going to be as follows. First, I'm going to craft a bunch of cables, like 60 of them. Go. Thanks. While that's crafting up, I'm going to head downstairs and start getting ready to run some stuff back this way. So let's see. What do we got going on over here? Dun, 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 dun. Bat mode. Um, I don't know if I need this power line to continue to run down this path, but I figured it might not be a terrible idea to leave it there. So let's light this area up a bit. And I like to automate and get a line over here for Emmy. All right, guys, I think I found the best plan for this. So let's see, what do we got? We've got about nine channels left on this uh, cable coming out of the Emmy controller here. So this is a nice spot to stick one of these dudes. And then we will place a P2P tunnel here. So we're gonna go ahead and probably have, let's say here, we'll put the P2P connection on this one. And then we can have this go into here. Let's get out our, our memory card. Successfully save settings. Uh, remember we are going to want power. So let's get ourselves a quartz guy here real quick before we forget, because I always forget. Uh, quartz fiber, perfect. That can connect right on this side here. Whoops. So used to having my wrench there. That's where we want it. And then um, we'll just do this and that. So that'll be good, right? So power's here, but no actual data going through there. Good. And then I'm just going to run cabling like so. And I requested more cables, so they should be crafted by now. Awesome. We'll put those away, because I don't think I need that many. Let's get this over here. So this will give us uh, access to our AE network from the area that we have our blood magic set up in. And that's pretty much what I'm going to want. 
I actually spent a little time looking for like the best place to run this cable to, and this is what I came up with. Cool. So right here we'll have our P2P connection coming out. So let's unlock this tunnel by using the memory card and boom. Now we've loaded settings, so this line should be up and running. Um, if we wanted to keep an eye on the channels going through here, we should see two. Nice. But we don't really need that, so we'll leave that off. And then coming out of here, there should be zero channels so far because there's not actually anything hooked up. Uh, where do I want to have a channel? Good question. Let's pop out right up here. I'm going to remove this chest and remove this connection here. And what I'd like to have is an ME interface over here. So craft one of those for me. Should be quick. Dun, 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 dun. There we go. And the ME interface's job will be to sit right, mm, I'm going to say, here. That shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, I think that'll look good. I might actually want, hmm, debating if I actually want that underneath more. Let's put the M interface down here. I want this to look good, but also be like super functional and automatable. Um, so the ME interface, now that we've got a connection here, we should see this light up. Boom, one channel in use. I'm going to tell this guy to keep, let's say at all times for now, one piece of smooth stone. Because remember, in order to craft things in here, we want one piece of smooth stone to sit inside. Good deal? Cool. Um, we're going to want this chest. Hmm. This chest will probably be fine as it is now, but we can get rid of some of the junk that's in there. So let's put this stuff away. Uh, we're going to put away the runes and the filters. And some other things that I collected while I was clearing out terrain underneath. So what I want to have is a system, and uh, I'm probably going to remove this connection. He should no longer really be needed. Cool. All right, so that's phase one. Let's get phase two of this build ready. All right, now phase two of this build is rather straightforward-ish. Um, it's straightforward if you're familiar with the mod that I'm going to use, and it might be a little confusing if you're not, but that's okay because I'm going to do my best to explain it to you. Uh, I'm going to move everything down here for the time being, and I might wind up putting a storage bus on this chest so that we have access to things, but not to worry, we're going to be alright. Uh, what mod am I going to use? Well, it's actually pretty cool. I'm going to use Steve's Factory Manager. Oh yeah. Uh, so the nice thing about Steve's Factory Manager is we should have no problem connecting to everything. So right now, Steve's Factory Manager should have access to the following inventories. It should have access to the ME interface, which is right next to it. It should have access to the blood altar, and it should have access to the chest. Nice. So what that means is that we no longer have to have anything up here and ugly. I do want to eventually move all this stuff around so that it actually looks nice and we just have the altar up here. But we'll get to that. For now, we're just going to sit here and say, hey, we've got, you know, what we've got moved down here. We'll move that stuff in a bit. So next thing to work on is the machine inventory manager's configuration. So what do we want to have? Our goal, um, and not that this chest, but come on, go away. I don't even know why. All oh, right. Uh, this. Our goal is to have... 128 of each of these types of slates. So if we look up slates in NEI, we'll see blank, reinforced, um, imbued, and demonic. Okay, demonic is the tier four one, um, and this is tier three, and this is tier two, and this is tier one. So let's start with the way I like to do things, and this is gonna hopefully help you guys understand how to do some testing and practicing of stuff. Let's plan it out so that we have just a small number first and test it to make sure everything works, and then we'll bump it up to a larger number. So let's start with blank slates, because that'll be the easiest thing, okay? So our goal here will be to say that our first thing we wanna do is find an input, right? Um, we're going to specify that we should move one piece of stone into the altar, and that should be the first thing we do. So our input inventory will be the chest or the ME interface, right? The ME interface is gonna be our input. 
target doesn't matter, it's whichever side you're pulling out of, we'll just say north, and we'll whitelist stone. So only stone can be pulled out, and we'll specify that it should only ever pull one. But because we have the interface only keeping one, that should be a problem. All right, our output will be to the blood altar. So we'll say inventory, uh, ME interface, blood altar, cool. And then what we'll do is the following. Configure to insert on, I guess, the north side, doesn't really matter. Uh, whitelist, specify one piece of stone once again. Cool. So now what it should do is it'll always move one piece of stone from here into the altar when there's room in both the altar, um, you know, for the piece of stone to live. However, right now, and something we're going to want to keep in mind of for later, is we've got a blood orb in there. And we want to kind of leave that blood orb there, especially when we're not trying to craft things. So... Let's talk about how we're going to handle that thing. Here we go. Uh, we're going to configure another trigger, which is going to be separate from this one. And his job is going to be responsible for understanding when we need to actually craft things. Okay. So we're going to do a conditional. And that is right here. And we're going to say if the chest, whatever side, requires all, we'll say uh, slate. and blank slate. And we're gonna specify that there needs to be 10 in there, okay? If there's 10 blank slates, then we're going to do the following, right? Input and output. So if there are not 10 slates, we need to use the altar for crafting. So we're going to say if there's not 10 blank slates, so if it's false, then we're gonna move from the altar on the north side for now, we'll just say anything that's in there. Uh, but eh, actually, I should say I should say orb. Those are all florbs. Wow, there's a lot of florbs. Magician's blood orb. That's what we currently have. So we'll say move that out of there and output inventory chest. Cool. So in the event that there's not ten blank slates in the chest will move the blood orb to it. So watch what happens when I connect the trigger. We should wind up seeing a blood orb in here. So there's not 10 blank slates, right? Um, condition items, precise detection. Yeah, that should be good. It should be moving it. Did I not specify an inventory here? No, blood altar selected, north, magician's blood orb. Output, empty blacklist. Let's do an empty blacklist here and see if it's not detecting the blood orb for some reason. There we go. So it might be because current owner is direwolf20. So let's do this. We'll change the input to items, whitelist. We'll say magician's blood orb. And instead of saying precise detection, we'll say NBT independent detection. So it doesn't care about NBT data. So if we remove the trigger so that this thing's not running anymore, and then we pop upstairs real quick and put the orb back in. And then reconnect the trigger with the input whitelist it should wind up moving the blood orb out for us. Cool. Um, now, the alternative will be when we do have 10 blank slates, we're going to want to move this thing back in. So what we're going to say is if we do have 10 blank slates, then the target to pull items from is the chest. Target doesn't matter. And items will be a whitelist. Magician's blood orb, which is NBT independent. Doesn't matter who owns it. Uh, and output will be the blood altar on the north side. Empty blacklist means any items allowed in there. So we'll set this guy to true. And now to test it, let's go ahead and change this conditional. Uh, we're going to change it to be five. Okay. So if we say condition items blank slate is five. Okay, check this out. So when we have more than five in there, it should move the blood orb back. When we have less than five in there, it should bring the blood orb out. See how that works? Pretty cool, right? So that's our goal. 
Now, because we're always going to want to make sure that we've pulled the orb out before we start doing this stuff over here, instead of having this trigger, I'm going to delete it, and we're going to wind up doing the inventory move over here. Because what this means is we'll flow it right after this. So we'll follow through here and say, um, after you've moved the orb out, that's when you're going to want to move the cobblestone into the correct inventory, right? So we'll say input inventory is ME interface. One piece of smooth stone. Output is blood altar. That's activated, right? Selected, yes. And it's a little hard to see sometimes. We'll make sure it's selected. North. There we go. Cool. So now if we connect these things, and I do want to have a way out of here. So let's see. What's a good way to get out? I guess I'll go through these marble stairs and reconnect them in a minute. So you are right now cooking up because we don't have enough blank slates in there. Cool. Now, so far we haven't told it how to get this item out. So we're gonna do that piece next. And this is pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is have a separate trigger, a separate thing that's responsible for moving stuff out. Uh, the input inventory will be the blood altar. The target will be north, doesn't matter which side you pull from. And the items will be blank slate. There it is. And we're going to specify, it doesn't matter, right? So those are the items that are allowed to be pulled out of the input. Um, now for the output is going to be the chest. Target will be north, activate. Item, whitelist. We're gonna specify blank slates again. But this time we're gonna tell it how many are allowed to live in the chest. It won't pull it out if there's already some in there. So we'll specify amount. We will say, let's say five for now. Cool. Let's actually say six. Yeah, six are allowed to move into there. Cool. Um, so once we connect these guys, watch what happens. So if I take this thing out of here, which is exactly what I'm gonna do, we're gonna let this thing start cooking. Okay, and it should get pulled out the moment we've gotten our blank slate. Boom, blank slate pulled out, and a new piece of smooth stone was put in, and we've got four in there now. As soon as this converts to a blank slate, it should get pulled out. Boom, it got pulled out. Now what goes in next? The Magician's Blood Orb, because we now have five blank slates in here. So we follow the logic, right? If we don't have five blank slates, then pull out the Blood Orb, Put it in the chest, then pull a piece of cobblestone out and put it in the altar. If we do have five blank slates, then put the blood orb from the chest into the altar, right? And all the time we're checking to say, hey, um, pull out a uh, blank slate and put it in the chest, but try not to have any more than six of these in the chest. And I'll explain why we're doing that in a minute because it's going to relate. So now, whenever we pull out a blank slate, watch what happens. Boom, immediately the blood orb comes out. A piece of smooth stone is up there being converted into a blank slate. Now we have five blank slates again in the system and the blood orb is put back. How cool is that? I know we're running late on this episode, but I wanna show you one more trick. We're going to change this conditional to not only check for um, blank slates, but we also now wanna add in reinforce slates. So first thing I'll do is I'll configure the output here. Um, not only, let's see, items, I'm going to make this an empty blacklist. You can pull anything you want out of there, but the only place it's allowed to land is the inventory output. And the only thing that's allowed to be moved there is up to six blank slates. And now we're going to add reinforced slates. I am not having a good time typing. Reinforced slates. Come on now, catch up. There they are, reinforced slates, and we're going to specify this amount to also be six, okay? Now we're telling this that you're allowed to pull reinforced slates out of here, also regular slates. So let's see what happens when we add this conditional. We're gonna say items. We need to specify that at all times we wanna have uh, five reinforced slates. So we're just gonna add this conditional as well. 
there we go, five reinforced slates, and requires all, meaning we have to have both matches before we allow this thing to proceed. So right now, because there's 21, nothing's gonna happen. But watch what happens when we bring this down less than five. You ready? One more, and boom. Now it pulled out the Magician's Blood Orb. The first thing it's probably gonna do is try and pull out um, the blank slate, which it did and brought us up to six. But now that we have six, it's not going to pull out the blank slate because only six are allowed to be kept in the chest at any given time. It's now going to wait for it to upgrade to a reinforced slate, at which point it'll pull that one out. Boom. And now it'll put the Magician's Blood Orb back in. Nice. So just to repeat, Whenever we pull blank slates out when we're less than five, it immediately pulls out the Magician's Blood Orb, goes ahead and inserts the blank slate, and then we're done deal, right? Cool. So I'm gonna go ahead, I just wanted to test this with six, but I'm actually gonna change these to specify five. I want it to match exactly what I've got going on here. So we'll switch these to five, that should be cool. And then if I pull out a reinforced slate, It'll pull out the Magician's Blood Orb, put a piece of stone in, upgrade it to a reinforced slate, and you get the picture. So Steve's Factory Manager makes automating the Blood Altar extremely easy, if you understand Steve's Factory Manager a bit. Um, now I know some people feel like Steve's Factory Manager is kind of like programming, but I feel like it's a very good logical system that's very easy without having to know code. You just need to think logically. So that's why I really wanted to show this on camera to you guys, because if you can think logically with Steve's Factory Manager, you can do almost anything with inventory manipulation, specifically doing this. So what I'm gonna do is add to this and add re the imbued and the demonic slates. So um, I'm going to do that off camera real quick and then we'll be back. So now I've told the output imbued slate, reinforce slate. I'm going to do the same for the conditional. Here we go. Imbued slate, specify amount five. And specify amount five. Cool. And what we should see is this thing's already been pulled out of here, and it'll start cooking up some imbued slates for us. And the same process will kick over. Um, as we have more and more slates populated in the chest, uh, it'll just always keep five of every one available. I'm going to upgrade this eventually to be 128, but the reason I went with five is so that you guys could see it and see how it works without having to wait for 128 of each of these to be crafted. Cool. So for now, we are way past the wrapping up point, but it's time to do it. So, Dial 20 signing off. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, we got a lot of things done, some miscellaneous tasks around AE, around uh, the, the auto crafting stuff with our good friends and all that cool things. Uh, I'm probably going to upgrade this altar a little bit more, have more runes of sacrifice, because I think we're probably using up um, the uh, life essence points that we have faster than we can, so that's okay. Um, next episode, we will come back. I want to do more around blood magic automation. I want to get these ugly wires out of here, and I want to have this whole blood altar area look nice as well as function well. So you can see I've already focused on getting wires out of here. I'm going to do something similar. Um, we can use Steve's factory manager, believe it or not, to detect how much liquid is in a tank, I believe. Um, I think there's a module here for... Create flow control, create liquid condition. Uh, so the tank could be the blood altar, the target is the siding, and liquid requires all. If I said life essence, we can specify amount of buckets. Nice. So we can say if we have less than 10 buckets worth, then, you know, emit a redstone signal. And then this whole contraption that we have can kind of go away. And I can even use wireless redstone so that we don't have to run this long cable thing up here. Wouldn't that be nice? So that's something we'll focus on doing next episode. Uh, I Do me a favor, leave me comments about if you liked checking out the Steve's Factory Manager stuff. I really think it's nice for you guys to know, but I've had some people in the past feedback and say, hey, we didn't like that. So let me know. Comments, feedback, please. Um, for now, Dial 20 signing off. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. As always, take it easy.